You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Socks in the Basement is currently on YouTube. We've we've added a YouTube channel for Socks in the Basement. Only the last episode, this episode, the first two entries on there. It's not really because I expect you to listen to an audio podcast on YouTube, although people ask me when they come up to me and say, well, how do I subscribe? And I'll give them all these different apps, all these different podcast players. I'll tell them go to SocksInTheBasement.com, and they'll be like, well, are you on YouTube? I'm like, we're an audio podcast. Well, well can I listen on YouTube? Well, now you can't. And, and the great thing about this, Ed, is that this is our, our dipping of the toe into video because I've, I've started to buy the equipment so we can every once in a while bring people in to the nine-foot homemade oak bar. We get a big guest, and then you can see, like, the video version along with the audio version. I would not get rid of your, your audio subscription to Sacks in the Basement, right? Like, make sure you have that, but some bonus stuff that we'll eventually be able to put out there video form with our new YouTube channel. Well, I will go get the plastic surgery I've been putting off, uh, just in case. <laughs> yeah, now's the time to make yourself look pretty. Yeah, I, I mean, my eyes are still sparkling blue, but, you know, we'll, we'll take care of some of the other problems. No, you don't want to be ugly. You get ugly, then all of a sudden your boyfriend breaks up with you, then you're running around telling people it was a mutual decision, and everybody knows that that's bull. In the meantime, also remember that if you're listening to Socks in the Basement on some blog that's not affiliated with us, uh, those podcast players on those blogs are going away. You have until the end of the month. Make sure you are subscribed to us through SocksInTheBasement.com or any podcast player. We are found anywhere podcasts can be found and always at SocksInTheBasement.com. In this episode and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you proudly by Family Waterproofing Solutions. Learn what a difference a family makes. Get money off if you mention Socks in the Basement. They're available 24-7 at 708-330-4466 or check them out at FamilyDry.com. James Fox on this program in just a little bit, but I want to get into the postseason with you for just a moment, my friend, because I'm watching Bryce Harper do Bryce Harper things. It hurts me knowing that he could have been on the Chicago White Sox. It's so depressing because, well, okay, first of all, my brother-in-law is from Philadelphia, so I, I, I'm happy for the guy because he's living the life, right? The Eagles are doing great. The Phillies are in the World Series. Meanwhile, we're stuck with gnashing our teeth over Jose Abreu maybe not being re-signed and, and watching the Bears for a living, which is not ever fun. Yeah, what kills me, what, what absolutely drives me nuts about that whole offseason is – the Manny Machado thing where they were so seemingly sure, okay, the, the, the look on Kenny Williams' face in that press conference when, oh, well, we had the best offer. We thought we had no, the best you didn't. offer. No, you didn't. All lies. Never believe that. You know, but, no, I, 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 well, I never believe that either. But but they, were, they seemed to be so sure about Machado that they didn't bother to offer Bryce Harper a contract. There was no discussion with him, seemingly. And the guy would have come here and played. And he would have fit so many of the the things that the Sox needed the past couple of seasons in terms of that left-handed power bat, in terms of a right fielder, in terms of a guy that can protect the Abreus and the Roberts and the, you know, it just, and here he is putting the Phillies on his back, leading them to the World Series, and you're stuck watching and going, well, what if, what could have been? What, what would have been the impact of Bryce Harper on the White Sox the past couple of years? Would it have made a difference against the Astros last year? You know, could he have single-handedly kind of gotten them out of trouble and, and gotten them into the ALCS? Uh, you know, would it have made a difference this year in terms of wins and losses and actually getting into the playoffs? And, you know, he had some injury issues and stuff like that, so that's a maybe. But still, watching this, this is what October baseball is about. It's about the superstars coming out and becoming superstars, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he goes out and he signs a 13-year contract for $330 million. And right away, somebody will sit there and yell, well, you don't want the back end of that contract. Well, I don't care. I want to win championships. I want the World Series championships. I'll take the back end of it. I'll take it. And it's a back end that's smaller than it is now. It's actually a front-loaded deal. 
Like with inflation and everything, that's going to seem like nothing by the time we get to 2032. By then, $22 million is probably what it's going to cost for me to fill up my car. So, I mean, in reality, <laughs> how much is he really getting paid at the back end of the, of the, of the contract? Like he's making $26 million this year, but in his final, uh, I mean, like it drops off. Like his final three years, he's only making $22 million a year. Like the, it is a spread out contract. Sure, you're paying for some years at the very end, but how do you know that Bryce Harper doesn't just turn into one of these guys that at 38 is like a DH that hits 35 home runs and 250? And you can, yeah, it, we've seen guys do that. I would have signed Bryce Harper for that money in a heartbeat. I said it on this show before the deal was made. So this is not a hindsight thing. And this is why I watched Manny Machado play Bryce Harper and a bunch of other guys around the field the White Sox could have gone and gotten. I mean, Kyle Schwarber, like, wasn't even like considered by this team. Schwarber, I, I don't even, I don't, I don't understand why, but he was never even considered by this team as somebody that you could put out there. Look what he's doing it, it, this postseason, this playoff matchup, this World Series matchup between a Bryce Harper Phillies team that has multiple players on it that have come up in White Sox rumors and guys that were targeted by the team or should have been targeted by the team that everybody knew they should have gone out and gotten, and they didn't. It's that team against an Astros team that you pointed out just on the last episode, which people can check out on demand anytime they want to. You pointed out the similarities in how the White Sox were built and the Astros were built, and the only difference is talent evaluation they can let go of Correa and Springer and get through a, a, a scandal with cheating in 2017 and they're back in the World Series again and if they don't lose any games in the World Series and sweep they will be the only team to ever sweep through the postseason the 11-1 run that the White Sox had in 05 and the Yankees had I believe in 99 those go by the wayside. Those are the two greatest performances in the postseason, and I haven't seen this Astros team lose. So on display for you is going to be talent evaluation with a payroll that was $16 million less than the White Sox payroll, according to Spot Track, and players the White Sox should have gotten that they didn't go out and get playing each other in the World Series while we sit down and try to figure out our next manager and how we're going to fix a lineup. It's a damning World Series that you're going to be watching as a White Sox fan looking at the Phillies play the Astros. Yeah, and, and and you can you can hate watch if you want, you know, and you can sit there and you can say what you want to say about the Astros, but that $16 million less in payroll negates when you're talking about Astros versus White Sox, negates a lot of what people are saying about, well, they just need to go out and spend this money and do this. And, and you know, the Phillies have a higher payroll, yeah, you know, so there's a, there's a version of the of winning that is actually probably closer to what the 05 White Sox were, if you think about it. Going in and getting going out and getting free agents and putting together a team, you know, of of parts that aren't necessarily homegrown. But the Phillies are out there with a legitimate superstar, and that's who's leading their team. So it is it's there's a dichotomy there of two ways the White Sox could go, and they didn't go the superstar route because they failed to sign Manny Machado. And they didn't offer Bryce Harper the contract, and they tried to go the Astros route. And what we talked about in the last show about how you know there's there's similarities in terms of how many homegrown players they have on there. There are similarities in terms of where these players are are put in. There's a lot of similarities between the makeup of the team and how they approach these things. And it's that continued success that Rick Hahn wants. That's what the Astros have because they continue to be able to find talent to come into their starting rotation. They continue to be able to find talent to go into their outfield. But when they when they hit on a on a guy, it's it's good. It's a good player and there's always depth there. And it's it's infuriating to watch because yeah, all people want to talk about is, you know, Jose Altuve clutching his shirt. Don't rip my shirt off so they, they can't see the buzzer. You know, but in reality what we should be mad about is Jose Kitty, Luis Garcia, Christian Javier, Framber Valdez homegrown starting pitching with Justin Verlander. You know, you should be mad about Kyle Tucker being a homegrown right fielder. You should be mad about the fact that Jeremy Pena can step in for Carlos Correa and they don't miss a beat. And Alex Bregman's a solid third baseman. And, you know, they trade for Jordan Alvarez, who's supposed to be, you know, a superstar. And he actually hits. He is a superstar. And their, you know, aging Cuban first baseman, Yuli Gurriel, is, you know, every bit as good as Jose Abreu in a lot of ways. And yet... The White Sox are sitting there wondering if Lucas Giolito's 5.64 bloated ERA from this year can be moved 
for something useful as far as a second baseman or maybe, you know, a backup outfielder or something. Socks in the Basement listeners looking to switch to a new age of life or do that for mom or dad, grandma or grandpa. Check out Hyatt Home Medical Equipment right here on the south side. No reason to look at that assisted living option. You can stay in the home. You can set it up like a smart home. You can have an app that opens and closes doors and lifts that bring you from one floor to another. They can greatly reduce the fall risk in your house. If you have sleep apnea, they have the latest in CPAP technology, along with testing rooms so you can make sure you understand your equipment, plus They have the best in diabetes control. It's all located right here on the south side. You can check them out at hhme.com or stop in and see them. Socks in the Basement listeners, you get additional money off, plus they work with your insurance to lower the cost to the absolute lowest. 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. The White Sox are trying to switch it up a little bit this offseason, looking for a manager, possibly remaking this lineup just a little bit. The farm system is going to come into play, I believe, and that's why we have James Fox from Future Sox joining us right now. How are you, James? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm good. Look, I'm looking at the White Sox right now. I could get myself all entangled in who they could bring in as the manager. I can sit there and kind of subtract some money off of last year's payroll and play around with guys that I'd like to see them go get. I can come up with fake trades. But in reality, a lot of that stuff is in the ether and hard to control, and you really don't know how it's going to shake out, and it's hard to predict anything this front office does. But the one thing that I think is easy to take a look at right now, or I hope it is, and that's why I have you on, is looking at the White Sox farm system and trying to figure out what do they have in there? Like, you know, I I see a lot of, I think every list pretty much has Colas or Montgomery right up at the top of that farm system. Is that where you have them? Yeah, Montgomery's one for sure, just because he's a shortstop and he's like a little bit younger, obviously. But like, I understand people liking Oscar Colas better just because it's like more certainty. Like, look, I, I think Oscar Colas is going to be their right fielder next year. So it, this is like a different discussion for a different day. Like, I hope they get like another left-handed hitting outfielder as well. But I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with Oscar Colas being a member of the big league team in 2023. How do you project him out? I mean, do you look at him as a rookie and say, if the guy ends up hitting 250 and 15 home runs and hits in the bottom half of your lineup, you're totally happy with that in his rookie year? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I, mean, I would expect some struggles just because like the strikeout rate isn't great, but it's not crazy, right? It's not like 30% in the minors, but it is over 20. You know, he's slugged over five at every level. I, I think, yeah, he's got huge raw power. I think the big thing that impressed me with him is just that like he's good defensively. It's not even like, you know, okay defensively. Scouts said he was good in center, which means he might be above average and right. So, you know, it's like the left-handed hitting right fielder that we've all been waiting for, right? I mean, we'd still like them to spend some money, but I mean, you know, at least they do have an option there. So those top two guys, um, I think pretty universally are the top two in their system, but it is, but it is a system that's like a little bit better than it was a year ago, and and it could get a lot better depending on like a few of the guys that they've added. Two-part question for you. Looking at Colas and Montgomery, are they, A, not guys that you would expect the White Sox to deal in any kind of trade this offseason because of where they're at and roles they could fill? Because eventually, Montgomery just slots in as Tim Anderson you know, finishes out his career or prices himself out when he goes to his next contract in the next couple of years or whatever they end up doing with him. Is that a is that a fair thing to assess? And if it is or if it isn't, who are the trade candidates? Who are the pieces they have in the minor leagues you think they could use if they really do want to remake this lineup? Yes, yeah, so I don't think either one of those guys move. I mean, look, like nobody should be off the table, right? I mean, like if if like you were talking to the Angels about Shohei Otani or something and like they wanted Colson Montgomery, I mean you obviously just like make the deal right, but I don't think those guys are going anywhere. Their first round pick last year, lefty Noah Schultz uh, out of us, we go East. I doubt he goes anywhere as well, but I mean, anybody else, like I feel like it's, it could probably be used. They do kind of have an infield log jam. I know like Lenin Sosa really broke out last year. We all saw him in the majors. We saw how he was handled. You know, I, I just, I don't really think like he's bad because he looked bad in the majors. Right. So they kind of have to decide what they're going to do because they have Lenin Sosa, they have Jose Rodriguez, you know, you have Romy Gonzalez, Romy Gonzalez probably doesn't have a ton of trade value, but I mean, like, you know, one of those guys could like Jose Rodriguez could, could be used in a, in a deal for something, right? Like he's not going to bring you back 
like a ton, but I mean, Jose Rodriguez, I would say, Lenin Sosa, like those type of guys. Um, and then, you know, on the, oh, and then Brian Ramos too, I should mention, like the Cuban third baseman, he was very good this year. So him and Rodriguez will probably get added to the 40 man in advance of rule five. They'll protect those guys. But then they do have some pitching like Norway Vera is a guy people know. Um, Christian Mena is a Dominican that really burst out of the scene. And then Sean Burke, Sean Burke was a third rounder a couple of years ago. Um, he made it all the way up to triple a this past season. So I think any of those guys could be used in deals. And then, and then you just shouldn't be surprised if any of any of like the, Matthew Thompson, Jared Kelly type guys, like any of those guys could get moved at any time, I would think. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the system's a lot better, but they, they don't have these like untouchable pieces that you would have like thought of before. Something we've talked about on this show with you before, especially around trade deadline time over the last couple of years, is that the White Sox don't have enough in their system to compete with other teams that are going for the same player out there. It seems like they just don't have the capital or they'd have to completely overpay and deal a guy like Montgomery is, has anything changed? Is it different in the off season? Do you see it is a, a greater possibility that they could put together a package of minor league guys to acquire somebody who could help them in 2023? Yeah, I think maybe, I mean, the thing is though, somebody's going to really have to like, you know, like Brian Ramos, like if somebody loves Brian Ramos, right? Like, maybe you can use him and Sean Burke to like go get something that you need. Right. I think one of the problems with the deadline is the White Sox have, well, they have a lot of issues, but they, they usually like, they don't want to pay the price for like a rental, right? They don't, they don't want to trade one of these guys that we just talked about for a rental for the rest of the year. Right. But they also don't have the pieces to get anybody with control. So it's like this, you know, this like conundrum, they're like always fighting themselves over. Right. So yeah, I think it's like that middle, the middle part of their system. Like you could get anybody with Colson Montgomery, but like they're just, they're not going to do that. So then it's like, you know, they're probably peddling some of these other guys and other teams can beat them. The, you know, the one area that's good is they have, they have started to draft more high school players and they, they finally started to like sign some young guys in the international market too. Like you and I have talked a lot about that and they get a lot of praise for, you know, some of the guys they sign internationally and I have been critical of like their strategy, but I mean, their top 10 prospects, I mean, like Oscar Colas, Sosa, Ramos, Vera, Jose Rodriguez, Christian Mena, like even Sustinus, like those guys are all signed internationally. So they, they've done a much better job of like getting guys that actually look like they might be big leaguers at some point. I went to a high school football game on Friday. I know that you're a big high school football guy. Uh, and, and I went and saw Brother Rice get beat by by Marist at Brother Rice. And while I was sitting there with my father at halftime, Michael Massey of the Kansas City Royals comes out and they they get a, a Kansas City Royals jersey. They list all of his accomplishments. He's a Rice guy. He grew up in the neighborhood, went to Illinois uh, before he becomes a fourth round draft pick. And they go through all the things that he's done in the Royal system since he was drafted in the fourth round, especially like I think he won the gold glove of the minor league system he was in, which is incredible. And then he gets up and and I've heard rumors already for, through the grapevine here in this neighborhood that the Royals really like him and they like to keep him around for a long time. And here's a guy who wasn't a high end first round prospect. One of the things I complain about all the time with this team is if it isn't a first round pick, you don't see an awful lot of talent develop inside of this system. Is there a guy down there that you have hope could actually turn into a player like that? What what barricades the White Sox from doing the same kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, like they kind of do it a little bit, right? But it's like utility guy. So I mean, it's like a similar thing. Like if you know, if Romy Gonzalez would have like kept playing well, or if he you know is kind of like the high end of that guy that we saw. I mean, that's an 18th rounder. Um, like Adam Engel went in the 19th round. Aaron Bummer went in the 19th round. So like they do it. They just like they haven't really unearthed position players like you've, like you've talked about. And I think like a lot of times you have to get lucky on like a college guy. I mean, I think a good example of it is like Marcus Simeon. They took Marcus Simeon in round six out of Cal and like, you know, kind of decided that he couldn't play shortstop or whatever and then traded him. And now he's kind of a star. So, you know, I think that's like a good example of it. I just think it's, you know, it, it's kind of random. There there are some guys um, that are like they took Jordan Sprinkle last year as a name I can give you. He was a fourth rounder at a UC Santa Barbara kind of just like didn't hit, but it's a premium defender at short with speed. Like if he hits at all, you know, he, he'll probably make it. So, 
that's one name. They do, you know, they just they 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 need to do a better job. I, I like what they've done under Mike Shirley, but you know, it's been a a five round draft and then two twenty round drafts after that. So you know, you just got to start stacking draft classes. And if they do so, the system will be a lot better than it you know it was. It's definitely not thirty anymore, so that's good. Our guest James Fox and every guest on Socks in the Basement brought to you proudly by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont shop, dine, drink, and explore. Check out the ginormous celebration for Halloween happening this Saturday at the Forge from 2 to 9 p.m. And find what you want to do in Lamont at lamontdowntown.com. All right, before I let you go, James, make your pick. Who do you want to be the manager of the White Sox, who do you think they're going to pick? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I don't know, Paul Canerco? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of feel like they're waiting for somebody because I, I just feel like, you know, if it were like Ron Washington or something, they would have just done it. Um, so I, I don't have any, like, information. I, I have no idea if people keep asking me, but I think, like, one that would be really interesting is if they hired Phillies hitting coach Kevin Long. Um I just like think it's different and like hitting coaches don't have like an extensive track record of, of being managers. Right. But like everywhere that dude has been, they've raked and like hit nothing but dingers and like the White Sox need to do that. So I could totally see them like maybe it's an over promotion. Right. But like you have Kevin Long and Ethan Cass and they just like kind of run the baseball team and he has a manager title. Like, you know, I, I think that one I would actually, be excited about. I love that name. That's like a name out of nowhere. You're like the first person I've heard that throws his name out there. That's really interesting. I was waiting for you to say, well, Espada, that's who they're waiting for. And you go with Kevin Long, hitting coach of the of the Phillies. He really did he really did a good job out there, didn't he? He did, and he was like with the Yankees for a long time and like Curtis Granderson swears by him and Schwarber like went to two stops because he was there and A Rod loves the guy. So um yeah, and you know, like Mark Feinsand of MLB.com said that there were like teams that were interested in Kevin Long, you know, to be the manager. I think last week, which I mean, it's just different, right? Because hitting coaches aren't usually managers, and I I know that the White Sox are one of those teams that has some level of interest. I have no idea, like you know, if they want to hire him. I just think like that would be interesting. Where a lot of these other ones, we just kind of be like, okay, now fix the team. Like I, you know, I, I unless it's like Ozzy or something, and like I don't think it's gonna be. Like any whoever they choose, it's just going to kind of be like, okay, we're going to have to talk ourselves into it. Check out James on Future Socks. I, I love everything that you do over there. You always have uh, great insight. Uh, you could talk about the minor leagues and you can still look at the team through a really good l- looking glass when you're trying to figure out the major league team and how it fits with the minor league system. I appreciate you jumping on. And we'll talk soon, my friend. All righty, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. Ed, what do you think about Kevin Long? I I thought that was a great name. I got a lot of thoughts on things that James said and what I think is actually happening with this team, but I thought that was a great name right there. I would would embrace that kind of move. I don't know who's in charge. I don't know if it's Jerry or if it's Kenny or if it's Rick or if they all sit down and they write down who they think should be the manager and they all hold up their place cards and if they don't match, they go back and write down another name. I don't know how this works. Do Do they roll dice? Do they play pickup sticks? How do they choose the manager? But I would be excited about a name like that. Yeah, Kevin Long, I, I, it's one of those names that you 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 hear it, it doesn't do anything for you, right? If you're a fan, you're sitting there going, who, what, why, why do I care about somebody's hitting coach? But then you look at what he's been able to accomplish, you look at how many times his teams are in the playoffs, how well they do, and it's one of those where some guys just can coach baseball. Some guys can just do this, right? They can get through to players. They can run the X's and O's. They know, you know, how to work situationally. They know how to help guys out. And you need that in a manager as much as anything, right? You can't, you can't just sit there and say something like, you know, Bruce Bochy won a whole lot of games as a manager. So therefore he would be great as the next manager of the White Sox just because he's got a history. Because we did that once and it didn't quite work out as we saw. But yeah, I, I, you know, I think Kevin Long's an interesting name because it's also outside of the organization. It's a guy who comes from a couple different coaching trees. And, you know, again, success is something that this team needs. And, and I'm not against the idea that, look, this guy, it's, it's a little like 
calling a football, you know, calling a, a, a football head coach from uh, an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator standpoint, right? Sometimes you go in there and you say, hey, look, this guy's going to be all offense, but the defense is going to be terrible. Yeah, but we can score touchdowns. So if Kevin Long's a guy that can come in and move the White Sox offensively, and maybe he struggles a little bit with the pitching staff in the bullpen, so be it. You know, maybe that's the way we got to go. Just rely on the talent of the pitchers, make it easy for them that way, and hit our way into the playoffs. Not my, uh, not our way. I'm not going to be involved. Although, you know, it sounds like this guy could actually turn me into at least like a 235 hitter with maybe, you know, six or seven bombs. Yeah, he might get you a couple of home runs in there. I, I think if he worked with you, he yeah. could even me one of them. Yeah, exactly. He'd be an interesting person to sit down and talk with uh, when we do the $1,000 guest bounty this offseason brought to you by Parente and Norum. Go to pninjurylaw.com and they will... Uh, consult with you, especially if you've been injured, work, car accident, whatever. Uh, they're providing the thousand bucks that we're giving away to a fan. Uh, if that fan is able to hook us up with a really cool guest, best guest of the off season, that fan gets a thousand dollars. We've also had players play for themselves or for a charity. Liam Hendricks last year played for a charity. He didn't win, but he, that that's how he competed in the thousand dollar guest bounty. I'll give you a little insight. I've been exchanging emails. We're in that period of time where I'm starting now to reach out to folks. And there's a few really right. interesting names that we might have on this show in the next month or so once we get it all lined up. I think the first time we had somebody last off season was when November hit, and we might be able to do that again. One of which, one of those names associated with the 05 Chicago White Sox. All right, I'm not giving away any more because I, like, I, I'm, I don't know if it's going to happen. But I think that's awesome. And if we do that, I might have to go buy that person a beer. I have a, a standing thing in which I buy any member of the 05 White Sox or anybody had anything to do with them winning that World Series a beer. It made my dad cry tears of joy. My grandfather got to see it uh, two months before he passed away. I mean, it, it was something that was such an important thing that if I ever bump in, to a member of that team or anybody that had anything to do with that team, they get a beer on me. If they want a good beer, maybe I take them over to Hailstorm Brewing Company, Tinley Park, 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. They got a brand new brewer since the beginning of the year, Will Turner. He's got some great stuff. He's really good at stouts and barrel-aged things, and I would imagine there's some fun stuff coming up here in the winter. They have a huge selection out there. Uh, Tinley is really becoming like one of the craft beer scenes, and Hailstorm is absolutely leading the way. Stop in there and see them this weekend. They've got all kinds of good stuff going on. Uh, they've got music on the 28th and on the 29th. They got their trivia night coming up here on the 27th. It's a horror movie trivia night, and coming up on November the 5th, they're doing beer and yoga. Get out there and check them out at 8060 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue, and check them out online at hailstormbrewing.com. How do you think the managerial consortium, the, the Han and Williams and Reinsdorf trio, that I think is all having something to say in this decision, how do you think that's going? Because I have a vision based upon last week's rumors that when it was reported by a few people that Joe Espada looks like he could be the manager of the Chicago White Sox and Twitter had that rumor flying about furiously, like a couple hours later, it came out that Ozzy Guillen was definitely getting an interview this week. And I envisioned Rick picking his manager just like he did with Hinch. Because that would be the Rick Hahn pick, wouldn't it? It's just like picking really well in the first round of drafts and doing a really good job of grabbing highly rated Cuban prospects. Like, if it's something he can find on the internet just like me by going to the MLB Top 100 prospect list, Rick Hahn can do it just like I could do it. It's finding the diamond in the rough he's not very good at. But that sounds like his pick because it's the popular pick that a lot of teams want to talk to Joe Espada. And then I imagine... Ryan starts saying, but what about Ozzy? And that's why that comes out through, I think, Bruce Levine. There are a few other guys that I just envision talk to Jerry Reinsdorf. And meanwhile, Kenny Williams is sitting there going, well, why don't we just promote Chris Getz so my kid can get a get a promotion in the in the system? Like, his, I think he's right behind Getz right now in the pecking order in the minor leagues. Like, that's what I, I see happening in my crazy conspiracy theory mind. What do you see? I see them trying to contact the spirit of Bill Vec using a Ouija board. <laughs> but none of them knows how a Ouija board works. So they're just looking at Twitter and seeing what everybody else is saying. No, I, 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 I you're probably pretty close to accurate there. Um, Hans certainly got guys in mind and 
Jerry clearly has guys in mind and Kenny, you know, I, I don't know. I really don't honestly don't know what Kenny Williams is thinking um, at any point anymore. Cause I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure how big his voice is. Cause we don't hear about him. Right. You know, you know, he's there, you know, he's in the background doing stuff, but you don't directly hear much about him saying like, okay, you know, this was a Kenny pick or this was a Kenny trade or this was a Kenny signing. Kenny lurks. He's got his fingers on certain things in there. Uh, you could tell. Oh, yeah. Right, he's got to be, right? He's got to be. Maybe he just like stands like off to the side and doesn't say anything. And you don't really know. You kind of forget he's there. Um, my kids do this, you know, where they'll they'll just kind of be in the room with me and I'll sort of forget. I'll go back to what I was doing. I'll forget I was there. And then I'll say something and they'll just jump in out of nowhere and make it, you know, give you that jump scare. Right. Right. So maybe that's what Rick's doing. He's sitting there going, you know, a spot that checks all the boxes. I mean, you know, outside the organization, they've had a lot of success on the Astros. Uh, you know, he's a bench coach. He comes highly recommended. He's highly sought after around the league. And, you know, I think I, I think this is really, you know, he's just talking to himself. I think this is what it is. And Kenny just jumps out of nowhere. Promote gets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then here comes Kenny, here comes. Would you get here? Here comes Jerry, and he's like, "What about Ozzy? What? what you know, why, yeah, why, why can't we Jerry bring him said, I'm talking to Ozzy next week about what the managerial job. What you know? I imagine them every day sitting down at a big circular table, right? Like that's what I imagine. They've got all their names like out in front of them, and they're they're ready to go, and they're all going to pitch their argument. And then there's just this roundabout like back and forth about who they should pick, right? Like maybe it's like, we're all going to say a name at once. They all say it. It's three different names. They get frustrated. They go to lunch. They come back. They try again. They all give up. Or like James Fox said, they have their person in mind and they're waiting for the World Series to end. And that would mean Espada or as he said, and I, I, again, it's such a such an interesting take. And it's made me look him up uh, a couple of times since he brought it up. Kevin Long from the Phillies. It's Espada. It's Long. It's Ozzy, or it's the surprise internal hire that they promised us they weren't going to do. That's it right now. I think he's right. Ron Washington ain't walking through that door because they would have hired him by now. It's it's one. It's yeah. it's going to be Long Espada, Ozzy Guillen. Uh, you know, just walking in the door, and the and the argument being, we already have a guy that's won a World Series. He knows his team better than anybody else, and that would be the owner's move. That's what that would be. I don't think Han would want him in there. I think that would be Jerry. Or it's the weird internal pick that they were all able to agree on. That that's the only that that's how this is shaping up. I think you're right about how it's shaping up. I I question whether or not they're all sitting around in a room together talking about this, and I hope that's what they're doing. Because I envision them all having interns and those interns <laughs> literally running into each other in the hallways, trying to run back and forth between the three offices, <laughs> delivering messages because it's kind of like when a married couple is breaking up right. and they're not really broken up right. and they might still stay married, but they don't really want to talk to each other. So they start saying things like, you know, Hey son, come here, <laughs> go tell your mom this. I bet you the first two hours are just back and forth messages trying to figure out which office they're going to have the meeting at. Can you guys come down to well, my yeah, office? That too. I'd rather do it in my office. <laughs> and by the time they get it settled, which office now they got to talk about lunch. Oh yeah. They got to figure out to about 11 o'clock. Yeah. You got to start making the lunch. Yeah. Plans. I mean, it's no wonder that this is taking so long. So the answer boys is Jerry's office. Pizza is always good. And, uh, don't hire Chris Katz. With the way we talk about these cowards, no wonder they won't have socks fest again this year. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.